Uh, this one was a private message, so I'm not going to say their name. Uh, they said, if you don't mind, can you ask Steve about the place where the, the blessings and the curses are given? What is his opinion on the location as several significant events occurred here? What is his opinion of this maybe possibly being the location of the Garden of Eden? Because they heard Rob Skiba uh, do a teaching that it may be the side is the tree of life and the other, the tree of knowledge. Thank you guys. Uh, and I'm not going to say their name because it was a private yeah. message. No, it's a good evil. Yeah. You know, that's an interesting point. And I've heard people discuss that before. And I wish I could say I've studied into that more deeper. And, and I haven't. Um, when I, what I have heard, it does make you, you know, think, wow, this is really cool and interesting. Now, is it true? I don't know. But I, I, to this point, I have not seen anything to disprove it. You know, so if I can't find anything to disprove something, I, you have to at least leave it on the table as plausible. You know, and I think that's very interesting for sure. If I'm not mistaken, I think that teaching is the uh, Yahuwah triangle uh, yes. that he does. I actually believe that Abraham is the key that we can actually literally follow Abraham back to the Garden of Eden. And that prompted me to create a, another timeline chart, uh, really zooming in on the life of Abraham and how Abraham and Nimrod, their, their lives overlapped. Uh, and I mean, there's significant rivalry big time going on here. Pretty, pretty wild story. I mean, you ever wonder why Abraham? Like, why did God call him? Why was he the one that he chose? Nimrod was in the land of Shinar, and he had essentially been made king of the world in 1948 a.m., year since creation. And that's the same year Abraham was born. In fact, it was Nimrod's evil kingship. It was part of the reason why Yahuwah called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, just south of Babylon, in the first place. Now, we read in Genesis chapter 11, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. Well, you know, they, their, they were, their intention apparently was to go to Canaan, but they didn't go there. They went to Haran. Well, there's something very telling about that. Ur of Chaldees, okay, the patron god of Ur was a god named Sin. <laughs> Sin was the god of the moon in the Mesopotamian mythology of Akkad, Assyria, and Babylonia. Nana is a Sumerian deity, the son of Enlil and Ninlil, and became identified with the Semitic Sin. The two chief seats of Nana's Sin worship were Ur in the south of Mesopotamia and Haran in the north. And Terah took Abraham, that's right, we're going back to Genesis 11, Terah took Abraham his son and Lot and the son of Haran, uh, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran. So what do we see here? Well, we know that um, Terah was an idol worshiper. Sin is commonly designated as Enzu, which means Lord of Wisdom. During the period 2600 to 2400 BC, that Ur exercised a large measure of supremacy over the Euphrates Valley, Sin was naturally regarded as the head of the Pantheon. It is to this period that we must trace such designations of Sin as Father of the Gods, Chief of the Gods, Creator of all things, and the like. The wisdom personified by the Moon God is likewise an expression of the science of astronomy or the practice of astrology. His wife was Ningal, the great lady, who bore him Utu, or Shamash, the sun, and Inanna, Ishtar, the goddess of the planet Venus. The tendency to centralize the powers of the universe leads to the establishment of the doctrine of a triad consisting of Sin, Nana, and his children. So Abraham's literally caught me to think about this in English terms, and I understand we're talking English here, but it's just interesting that Abraham was called out of Sin, out of Ur of the Chaldees to go to a place they would show him. But Terah didn't take him to Canaan. Abram's father, Terah, was an idol worshiper and one of the chief princes of Nimrod. Now, there was a problem that took place in Ur of the Chaldees that caused Terah to want to leave there because they didn't want to have deal with the issues with Nimrod, so they decided to leave there. But all he did is relocate from one sin worshiping area to another he went he's an idol worshiper so he went to the next logical place for people who worship sin 
we see in Joshua 24 too. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. We see in Joshua 9, 7, and 8, and the king Nimrod and all his servants and Terah with all his household were then the first of those that served gods of wood and stone. And Terah had 12 gods of large size made of wood and stone after the 12 months of the year. And he served each one monthly. And every month Terah would bring his meat offering and drink offering to the gods. Thus did Terah all his days. It, why did God pick uh, Abram? It, it, it's a pretty cool story, actually. Uh, you know, it, uh, Terah had all these gods, the 12 gods, you know, set up. And uh, earlier, uh, Abram had spent time with Noah and Shem, learning about the, the one true God. And, you know, he had questions. And when he came back to his father's house and he sees his dad, you know, worshiping all these gods that he knows his father made with his own hands. And so he's like, why, you know, why are you worshiping these things, you know? And, well, these are our gods. And so he had his mother bake up some really great food and everything. And he laid it out to eat in front of the, the, the gods there so they could have something to eat and waited. Of course, they don't eat. They don't do anything. So he's like, uh, and he got real frustrated by the whole thing. So he ended up grab, grabbing like an axe or a hatchet or something. And he smashed all, the, all of his father's gods. And then he put the axe or the hatchet into the hands of the biggest god that was there. And when his dad heard all the commotion and he came in there and saw all of his gods destroyed, he got mad at his son. He's flipping out on Abraham. What would you do this for? Why did you destroy all my gods? He goes, I didn't do it. He did. <laughs> he points to the, the big god holding the hatchet. And his dad's like, he didn't do it. He's just made of stone or wood or whatever it was. And Abraham's like, exactly. Hello, McFly. <laughs> what are you worshiping him for then? You know, he, he was fed up with the whole thing. And so you could see, you know, his heart. He's trying to figure out what the truth is. He heard the truth from Noah and Shem, and then he tried to figure it out for himself. Uh, and it caused no shortage of problems for him, uh, both with Nimrod as well as with his father, Terah. So Nimrod wants to get rid of him. Terah takes his family and leaves. We see in Genesis 12, 1 through 5. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. Okay, you left Ur, but you went to Haran. Get out of there. Leave your dad's house and all this sin worship stuff unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You notice I stress, stress the word thee? Because whenever I talk like I did a few minutes ago regarding the nation state of Israel, People start going off on me saying, oh, bless God, you know, you, you know, you, you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. Curse Israel, you're going to be cursed. Why are you cursing Israel? You're cursing yourself. And they say, you know, bless Israel and you'll be blessed and curse Israel and you'll be cursed. And I'm like, you guys actually like read Genesis 12 because that's not what it says. The, the context is Abram. Yeah, I'm going to make you in a nation. But he says, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you. The, an the antecedent here, the subject of the sentence the, of, of the story is Abram. I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So don't if you are in any measure of agreement with me regarding this nation state of Israel thing, don't let people pull Genesis 12 on you. Uh, in fact, if they do, open it up and say, it's talking about Abram. And it's not talking about a Zionist state <laughs> established in unbelief. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. So this is extraordinary. If you follow the path that Abraham took, or Abram at the time, his name hadn't changed yet, he starts out here in Sin and Ur of the Chaldees, Sin worshiping Ur, kind of goes up through the. Um, 
the the valley the, the valley there in between the Euphrates and the Tigris or the Hittichel, uh through Babylon the region there up into Nineveh following the the northern trek up here with the Hittichel, comes down over to Haran hangs out there because dad just went from one sin worshiping place to another then uh, Yahuwah said get out of there leave your father's house I say, okay, so I, I don't know where I'm going, but I'll just keep walking. And he keeps walking <clears throat> until God stops him in Shechem. Wow, Shechem. Why Shechem? Shechem is a very interesting place when you start looking through the scriptures. It's the first plot of land within Canaan owned by the house of Abraham. We see in Genesis 33. And Jacob came to uh, Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he brought a parcel, he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he created there an altar and called it Elilo, whatever, Israel. <laughs> I just butchered that, but <laughs> he called it whatever you see right there. That's what he called it. Okay, well, the point is, <laughs> the first plot of land in the promised land that was owned by the house of Abraham was Shechem, bought for 100 pieces of silver. This is also where Dinah was raped by Shechem, the man for whom the land was named. Simeon and Levi took vengeance and killed him for it, and pretty much everybody else too. Um, uh, then later we see after Joseph has his dream concerning the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him, his brothers become angry, right? They leave to go, quote, tend their father's flock in Shechem. Jacob slash Israel, the man, later sends his beloved son Joseph to go find them in Genesis 37. Now, the word Shechem means diligence or early rising. So while looking for his brothers in the place of early rising, he meets a certain man, it says in Genesis, but in Joshua it tells you he met the angel of the Lord, who tells him that they have departed, his brothers have departed for Dothan. Well, Dothan means their double sickness. The English word diligence means the attention and care legally expected or required of a person as a party to a contract. So they left their place of carefully tending to their father's flock to go to a place of double sickness in order to lay in wait for their brother whom they plotted to kill and destroy. Uh, when I tell you what I think Shechem really is, the significance of Shechem, this story takes on some really powerful meaning. But just keep this in mind. The father wants to send his son to his brothers, who should be diligently tending the flock in Shechem, but instead they went off to a place of double sickness, and there they are conniving to uh, kill their brother. <laughs> wow, this is a powerful story. After the exodus and the 40 days wandering in the wilderness, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan and were told to go to, ding, 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 Shechem, and build an altar on Mount Ebal and divide the tribes in half, with one part on Mount Gerizim to pronounce the blessings of the Torah, and the other on Mount Ebal to pronounce the curses, Deuteronomy 11, 29, and Deuteronomy 27, 1 through 29, 1. Now, this is extraordinary. So just to recap, Abraham leaves early Chaldees, is told to go to a place where he, you know, father said he'll he'll stop him when he gets there. He takes a little pit stop in Haran, comes, travels south through the Levant. God says, stop at Shechem. Later, there's stuff that happens with Jacob and Shechem. There's stuff that happens with, uh, you know, Joseph and Shechem. And then, you, you know, later you have Joseph being sold into slavery down in, or, or yeah, into Egypt and, you know, the whole deal with Potiphar and he goes to prison. He comes out, made second in charge and everything. And then the house of Jacob comes down from Israel uh, or the land of Canaan, I should say. The, uh, the, and and um, God says both to Joseph and to Jacob that he will make Jacob uh, and his family a great nation in Egypt. So he brought them down to Egypt. And then, of course, you know the story. Later, they eventually become slaves. They uh, have the exodus. They're going to head into the land, but they see the giants. They freak out. They disobey God. They don't believe God. So they have to wander around for 40 years. At the end of the 40 years, they're finally ready to go into the land. And where do they go? Ding, ding, ding. Shechem. Why Shechem? Why Shechem over and over and over again? Shechem, Shechem, Shechem. Well, I found another really cool clip uh, by Jim Staley. 
check out what he has to say about Shechem. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 27, it says this, Then Moshe, Moses, and the elders of Israel charged the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. So here it is. So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan into the land which the Lord God gives you that day, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime. And write on them all the words of this law, okay, and that word law is Torah, okay. Write on the words of this law, the Torah, which means instructions, when you cross over so that you may enter the land which the Lord God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God your fathers promised you. So it shall be when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up on Mount Ebal these stones, as I'm commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, right there in the center is the city of ancient Shechem, okay? This is a narrow passageway, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you the story. What Yahweh said is, He said, I want you to go in, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant, I want you to take half the tribes, and I want you to stand on half of them on Mount Gerizim, and I want you to take the other half of the tribes, and I want you to stand on Mount Ebal. And he says, I want you to proclaim the blessings... While I'm proclaiming the blessings, I want everyone to look to Mount Gerizim. And when you proclaim the curses, I want everyone to look at Mount Ebal. Right in the middle between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim is a natural amphitheater. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's, It's a natural amphitheater. It's a natural like valley. It's kind of off in the distance where the horizon is there. And that's where they stood, right in the valley, so everybody could hear, all, all, however many there were, a couple of million people. This is Joshua's altar. This was a spectacular, gorgeous altar. Right here between these two mountains is a derrick at Shechem where God's people were there, and on one side was the blessings, one side was the curses. He's using visuals to get his point across. Joshua builds, a, builds an altar, uses natural stones. The limestone is put around it for a reason because limestone is malleable. Ma- limestone you can write on. It, 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 you understand what I'm saying? It's a soft stone. You can only write on something that's soft. And he wants to write it on a heart of flesh, vellum limestone. And he says, I want my Torah to be written on your heart. They departed and they went to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, the same exact route as the Israelites are at right now. Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, I just showed you that, as far as the Teremith tree of Moray. There it is. So this is the very first, excuse me, very first time that we have someone stopping at the tree of Moray. What happens? The Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to Yahweh who had appeared to him. Are you kidding me? This is 400 years, ladies and gentlemen, before Joshua shows up with the Israelites in this exact same place. Now see, we don't live in the land, so we don't make these connections. But Abraham, that... What, 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 what was the covenant made from? What happened that day? Did he give him a can of Pepsi and say, drink, let's pray, you know. What's that? No? What, what happened that day? Something was cut in two. An animal was cut in two, remember? And two halves, and what happened? Abraham was put to sleep. And he went through the middle, did he not? Right here, ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason that Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are standing the way that they are, because they are standing as a witness. 400 years later, the altar that Abraham made and the picture, why do you think that he had half the tribes go on one side and half the tribes go on the other? And the tabernacle, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant is right dead center in between. Because this is the exact place where Yahweh walked between the two halves. Uh, That was an insight I did not have. Uh, I had already come to some conclusions, which I'll reveal to you in a minute, regarding what I think the deal is with Shechem, specifically Ebal and Gerizim. 
Um, and I'd come to this conclusion a couple of years ago, actually. Um, but then when I heard this teaching that Jim Staley, Sheila was watching the Torah portion on uh, Re'e, Re'e, however you pronounce that, to see. And uh, I just happened to walk by and hear him talking about this. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That's another piece of the puzzle I didn't have. And actually, when uh, Jim and I finally did connect with each other, we had some really cool conversations about all this because he hadn't put together what I was talking about. And I hadn't put together what he was talking about. So we, we were both able to contribute to each other a little bit here, I think. Um, and, and I found this. I told him about this, these two scriptures right here because uh, he's, you know, Jim's the one that made me aware of the idea that that could have been where Yahuwah walked between the, the pieces of the covenant with Abraham. You know, he put Abraham to sleep and he walked between the covenant himself. Well, in Psalm 60, verse 6, and also 108, 7, their, their parallel scriptures say the same thing. It says, God hath spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkoth. Um, so if you think about the idea that Yahuwah himself, and, and I believe he probably walked through in all his glory. You know, he put Abram to sleep, so he, he didn't see him. But if you can imagine this was one complete mountain range at one time, and somebody really big came through this right here. I did like a little figure eight around the, you know, as they did the way they would typically do a walk around the, the uh, covenant pieces like that. I don't know, but it, it's pretty interesting to think that that could have been the exact location where he brought Abram, where he did the covenant with Abram, and where the Israelites were. And if that's the case, because the prophecy that God gave to Abram uh, about the, his descendants coming into the land was fulfilled in the exact location where that promise was made. And that would be just like God to do that, frankly. So, you know, he puts Abram to sleep, says, your descendants will have this land, blah, 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 yada, yada. And um, years later, uh, 430 years later or so, Israelites come right through here. And they have to set the ark up right in the middle, probably on ground zero where the uh, animals were parted. And you put half the tribes on Ebal and half on Gerizim. And the half on Gerizim pronounces the blessings. And the half on Ebal pr pr pronounces the curses. And this is actually the perfect place for Joshua to bring the Israelites, divide them, and to do this little ceremony because it is a natural amphitheater. You, know, you could he could have stood right in the middle there, and everybody here could have heard him, and everybody here could have heard him. But why were the curses here and the blessings here? Well, it is my theory. It's a theory I've had for quite some time, is that th this is the original location of where the tree of life was at Gerizim, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at Ebal. They could have had blessings if they would have eaten of the tree of life, but they chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's why these guys had to pronounce the curses. These guys had to pronounce the blessings. And an altar had to be built on Ebal that had the writing of the Torah written all over it. Basically to say, hey, you guys, man screwed up here once. Remember not to do that again when you come back into the land, because I believe the land of Israel is the Garden of Eden. The land, of, the, the, the land that we call Israel is the Garden of Eden, and this is ground zero, in my opinion, of the Garden of Eden. This is where Adam and Eve blew it. And it could very well be the same place that, that Yahuwah walked through the pieces of the animals may have been the exact same location where he killed the animal to clothe Adam and Eve with after they said they were naked. Again, speculation, but um, it appears to be reasonable speculation at this point. And I would encourage you to do your own study uh, on Shechem because it, that's a big focal point right here over and over and over again. And I think the biggest one is, is as Yeshua, in this case Joshua, whose name means what? Yah is salvation, same name as our Savior, ushers in Israel, who didn't become Israel in the land of Canaan. They did. The nation of Israel was not established in the place that we call the nation of Israel. It was established in Africa, or more specifically, Egypt. See, there's this motif of creation in Egypt. If what I've suggested in part one is true, you got Adam being created in Egypt and then being placed in the garden. I think he was probably placed in Jerusalem. That's where I think he, he touched down. <laughs> That's where he was placed. And, and it could be also where Eve was brought to him, the bride. Um, could be. 
And I think a little further north from Jerusalem were the two trees, and they, they, they're wandering around through the garden. They see the trees right there. Yahuwah says, uh, you can have uh, anything you want in the garden, but you can't eat of that tree right there. Serpent shows up and says, Dad, hath God really say? You know, gets them to take a bite. They blow it. They feel naked. Animal sacrificed here. They got clothed. And, you know, the fall of man takes place. And, and lest they take of the tree of life and live forever, they get booted where? To the east. And if you go almost directly east from Shechem, you end up right in the vicinity of Babylon. So I believe that that's where they got booted out to. But in my opinion, this is ground zero. And when uh, God saw a man after his own heart, sort of like a David character in Abram, in Ur of the Chaldees, on the east side of the boundary of Eden, he said, you know, I think I could work with this guy. And I think he kind of skirted over the top of the boundary of, of, of uh, Eden and was brought down from the north and was stopped at Shechem. All kinds of stuff happens there. And, of course, after the exodus, they come right back to that same exact location. Uh, we see in Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 30, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if ye obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commands of the Lord your God. That sounds like some similar terminology, doesn't it? But turn, us, uh, turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods, which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse on, upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan, by the way where the sun goeth down in the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in the campaign over against Gilgal, beside the plains of Moray? It's a pretty specific location there. He's giving you some serious coordinates. For ye shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. See, this is not the land of Israel. It's not the land of the Jews. It's certainly not the land of the Rothschilds, and it's certainly not the land of the, of the Zionists and the Illuminists and the Freemasons. This is the land of Yahuwah, and he's the landlord, and he has uh, house rules. If you want to live in my land, here are the rules. And it started out, you only had one. <laughs> one. He, had, he was the greatest landlord of the greatest plot of property of land, and he said the only thing you can't do is have fr uh, fruit from that one tree. What did they do? They took from that one tree. Well, you got, they got evicted. They got booted out of Eden. And now when the, the whole nation is coming in, you're getting a repeat basically saying, hey, look, they blew it here before. This is the land that I promised to give you guys. This is the place that I want to dwell with you. Why else does Yahuwah, of all the places on the planet Earth, does God have his eye on Kuwait? No. Tanzania? No. Turkey? No. The Gulf of Aden? No. But he sure does have his eye on that little sliver of land right now. And has always had his eye on that land. And, and go read Leviticus 26 for the house rules. If you obey and do what he says, man, you have nothing but blessing. Amazing blessing in the land that he's provided for you. But if you don't, ooh, it's not good. Not good, not good. And uh, Leviticus goes on to say, hey, and if you don't learn your lesson, uh, you know, from the punishment you're going to get, you're going to get seven times the punishment. And I believe there's a reason why there's a whole bunch of us now starting to turn back to the Torah. Because if you do the math out, and uh, I mean, it comes out to basically 2009 from the time of the Assyrian um, dispersion where the northern kingdom was dispersed and, and the Ephraim, who was prophesied to become the multitude of Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles, multitude of the nations, was dispersed. And Judah repented after 70 years in Babylon. They got to go back. Ephraim never repented. So they got seven times their initial 390-year judgment from... Um, uh, what is it, Ezekiel um, 4, maybe? I forget what it was, where the prophet is told to lay on his side for, I think, 390 days, one day for a year. Well, they didn't learn it, so you got 390 times 7, and you get 2,700 and something. I'm going to talk about this in the next lecture, so I'll just kind of move on. But um, I, I believe what we're seeing is the return, uh, and Ephraim is repenting. And if Ephraim is repenting, 
and, and the end of that curse seven times the initial judgment is 2009. Most of the people that I know who are walking in this stuff are trying to or trying to get back to the basics here. Uh, I've talked to people from all over the world, for all over the United States and into Canada and, and as far away as South Africa. And on average, not everybody, but the, the, the large average uh, is people coming into the understanding of Torah again or for the first time in 2009. And that was that's certainly my testimony, as Sheila's as well. So if that's the case, then the fullness of the Gentiles are coming in. And that's the marker that, that I would be uh, moving my time clock to. Going, okay, you know, something's going to happen here. Um, and that's exciting because we're being pulled in from all areas. Around, uh, there's going to be a second exodus. Jeremiah talks about it. That, that'll be so great that, that people are going to basically forget about the one of Moses which was extraordinary if you think about it. Uh, but what's coming is going to be even greater than that. So, um, I, you know, I love my Jewish brothers, and I witness to them any time I get an opportunity to. I, I love any of the other tribes of Israel, too. Uh, I am, as a former Gentile, thrilled, jacked out of my mind, excited to have been adopted and grafted in to Israel, the bride of the Lamb, defined by the 12 gates of the 12 tribes of the new Jerusalem. I'm real excited about it, but I tell them don't go there <laughs> unless you personally feel called by God to go there. Wait, because that place is destined to get wiped out. Yeah, it is a fulfillment of prophecy, but it's not the ones we all hoping for. It's not the good ones. Uh, the fulfillment of prophecy that has yet to happen is two thirds getting killed. One third going through the fire. And Jesus saying, if you're in town, get out. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So I'm telling them, look, Hold off, wait, <clears throat> we'll all go in together because he's going to bring us in. And um, anyway, that's, I'll just move on <laughs> on that. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 30 continues along the same lines. For this commandment, which I command thee this day, is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shalt say, should have say, <laughs> who will go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? <laughs> <laughs> neither, neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say, <laughs> Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? How many people do you hear tell you that it's impossible to keep the commandments? Can't do it. Yet he's telling you point blank, you can. It's not too hard. It's not too far. First John 5, it says, This is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Why are they not burdensome? Because you know, if we screw up, it's okay. We have an advocate. First John 2, you know, you fall down, get back up. But if his Holy Spirit is living in you and he's written his, his law on your heart and your mind, well, th that should compel you to actually, oh, I don't know, want to obey God. And he's there to help you. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the helper. Right? Uh, I mean, he's telling us right here, it's not too hard. It's not too far. But the word is very nigh unto you in your mouth and in your heart that you may say, uh, that you may do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good. Well, I thought it was all death. Oh, and death and evil. Huh. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. How do you love God? Oh, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. What is the, everybody wants to say it's bondage. Oh, it's like bondage, bondage, the ministry of death, bondage. Well, Moses must have been on crack when he wrote this then because he clearly doesn't share the same view if what they're saying is right. No, I think they're on crack. Moses is right. He's telling you what the deal is here. The house rules are not too hard. But if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, hello, McFly, here's the answer, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God 
How do you do that? And that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. When I first really read this, I was struck with the idea of a very similar command, which was given uh, long before that. We see in Genesis 2, 9, 15 through 17, uh, 9 and 15 through 17. In verse 9 it says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Compare that with Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, this time, hello, McFly, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. And this is also, uh, Moses is making a vow here. I call heaven and earth as, as testimony right here. That's why Yeshua said, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle is going to in any way disappear from this thing that we call the Torah. Well, I, you know, I, I looked out the window a little while ago. It's, I, we're all still here. Huh. So Yeshua is actually validating the vow that Moses gave right here in Deuteronomy 30, 19. Adam and Eve chose death over life. That is why I believe Moses was in almost comical sense, giving the Israelites the answer to the question of which they should choose, life or death. Adam and Eve chose wrong. They were kicked out of the land due to disobedience. Shechem was a city of refuge within the promised land, Joshua 21, 21. Joshua gathered all the tribes and elders of Israel and made a covenant with the people of Shechem, Joshua 24, 25. The bones of Joseph, which were brought up from Egypt, were buried in Shechem. And the city became the inheritance of the children of Joseph, Joshua 24, 32. And if you've done any study on the life of Joseph, he is the absolute parallel word picture in living form of Yeshua. Draw a line down the center of your page, write Joseph on the left, put Yeshua on the right, and think of how many parallels you can see between the life of these two men. So it's interesting that all of it's going back and his, he's being buried there and his inheritance is there. Ground zero, folks, of the Garden of Eden, in my opinion. The conversation Yeshua had with the Samaritan woman at the well took place at a place believed to have been a suburb of Shechem in John 4, 3 through 42. Jacob's well is one of the few spots about the position of which all travelers are agreed. Jesus, passing from south to west, would pass up the valley of Machna until the road turns sharp to the west to enter the valley of Shechem between Ebal and Gerizim. Here is Jacob's field, and in the field is Jacob's well. That's from Ellicott's commentary for English readers on John 4, 6. Uh, again, another parallel. But like Adam, you broke my covenant and betrayed my trust. This is Hosea 6. And it says in the next couple of verses, the murderers traveling along the road to Shechem. So you have a parallel, again, a correlation, if you will, of Adam with Shechem right here again in Hosea. Just like we saw a correlation with Adam and creation. Israel is being brought back to Egypt because it, what? For God, its maker. So at this point, uh, at least in my mind anyway, I am completely 110% convinced that Israel is the Garden of Eden, and this is the location of the two, tr two trees. It is my firm belief that Abraham was led out of sin to Shechem, and that Yahuwah made his covenant of promise there, and that the Israelites, upon entering the land, had to first stop there, write out the commandments, and pronounce the blessings and curses, because this is ground zero in the Garden of Eden. Uh, here are just some other scriptures. I'll kind of close with this. We're running a little bit behind here, but uh, it's okay. Um, some more confirming scriptures, I believe, that show that Israel is the garden. You have correlations like in Joel 2, 1 through 3. It says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm in the holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? Because the land be is as the Garden of Eden before them. And this is in the context of heading towards the land of Israel. We see also in Ezekiel, uh, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, and I'm just going to skip down and read the bold parts here, For I will 
take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Who will? The Rothschilds, the United Nations? No, I will. Yahuwah will. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes so that you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And it says later, skipping down to verse 35, and they shall say, this land was desolate, is become like, what? <gasps> the Garden of Eden. Once again, Israel likened to the Garden of Eden. And Isaiah 51 Three, for the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Why? Because that's what it was in the first place. <laughs> there are plenty of other scriptures we could look at, but I think you get the point. I saw this uh, drawing somebody had done, uh, a rendering of the promised land. It was interesting because they were following the same river idea that I had regarding the peace on. And they said that they believed that this was the entire land uh, of promise right here. I actually disagree with this. Uh, it is compelling that it follows the Pison River, the Gihon slash Nile River, and the Euphrates. Uh, however, the problem I have with it is when you consider the wandering in the wilderness time, if, if it was all including this, then that meant the Israelites wandered around within the promised land. And I don't believe that to be the case. So I rather draw a line directly across from uh, this area right here where the Euphrates meets the Persian Gulf right to Giza. Uh, that keeps Mount Sinai and the wilderness wandering outside of the promised land. And then from here forward, they could enter into it. So I believe that this darker area is the entire area actually promised uh, to Abraham and his descendants. And I think an entire book can be written just on the significance of this point alone, but it's not within the scope of this work to do so. We're running out of time. Uh, I, I just want to say, look, his desire is for us to get back to the garden. That's what he wants. And I saw this picture. I thought it was beautiful because it's like this garden scene. And you got these three pillars of light right there, a really big one in the middle and two other ones uh, beside it. And I think that when Adam and Eve were created in the likeness of God, they, they had light suits, if you will. The, the, from a distance, this is what it might have looked like to see Yahuwah in fellowship with Adam and Eve, these light beams walking through the garden. His desire is for us to get back to the garden, but he has house rules. Um, and, and the proof is we're going to be doing the feast. Read Zechariah 14. I mean, we're going to be doing the feast anyway uh, in the millennial reign. So why not practice them now? Besides the fact they're a whole lot of fun and they are all about our Savior, Yeshua. All about him. Christmas, Easter, nothing. Has nothing to do with our Savior. It's a big counterfeit. Ditch two, get eight. Ditch the two beast feasts, you get eight appointed times. You get the Sabbath plus the, the, the feasts, the appointed times. Uh, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles. It's a good deal, guys. And if you want to get legalistic about it, he actually commands you to have fun. I know, I know it's crazy. It's horrible. You know, he's such a taskmaster. But, um, his desire is to fellowship with us. He is a holy God. He has established his holy days. And his, his desire since day one is to walk among us, to fellowship with us. So we might as well start practicing now, trying to get on his page. He, we're going to end up over there anyway, uh, if you're a believer. Uh, he's got house rules. He's a landlord. It's his land. And I'm looking forward to going there someday.